Welcome back to Questions You Never Thought to Ask, the Whitewater Kayaking Podcast. My name is Seth Ashworth, and this is your first time here. Welcome. If you're a regular listener, welcome back. This week, we've got a fun and exciting episode lined up for you. But just before we get started, I do have a quick and important announcement. I must start this podcast by saying thank you so much to the people who support on Patreon. Patreon is a crowdfunding platform which allows you to chip in uh, a, a couple of dollars every month just to help keep this podcast going. And you also get early access to the podcast, so it's usually up on there. Um, sometimes many weeks, sometimes just a few weeks before it goes live um, through the regular channels. So a little bit of a perk for you, a little bit of an incentive. Um, anyway, I couldn't run this podcast without those people, so I'm very grateful. I just want to extend once again another big thank you to them. Um, yep, yeah, for now, enjoy this podcast, and I will uh, see you in a future one. Okay, peace. All right, welcome back to Questions You Ever Thought to Ask, the Whitewater Kayaking Podcast. This week, I'm joined with, uh, I, I say Olympic hopeful canoeist, um, because Lois would have been on track to be going to the Olympics soon, just one, one qualifying race away from representing Canada uh, in, Lois, what, what, tell everyone what's, uh, what's up. Yeah, uh, so I was, yeah, we were racing qualifying this year for uh, slalom, women's canoe. Um, and we were, we were one race away from having a spot for Canada. And then that would have been, and that was also our deciding race in Brazil, uh, in April, just before everything kind of went to, well, where it is now. And <laughs> so, yeah, that was, All right, let's, we um, let's, let's backtrack. I've got a oh, couple sorry. of important questions. Yeah. One, do you introduce yourself as like kayaker or canoeer? I am a canoe slalom athlete, but I do kayak as well. So I think canoe slalom, I like the term because it kind of, that's our, our sport term and it encompasses kayaking as well and the subtle nuances of it all. <laughs> well, when you're, when so, you're like shooting new people, when you meet them in the street, you're like, I'm, I'm a, a canoe kayaker. slalom or do you say you're no, a I'm kayaker? A, I'm a kayaker. Okay. It's easier. Okay, that's Nobody knows what get canoe off. slalom is. <laughs> and then Lois, do you want to give everyone a bit of a rundown on how you got to being an Olympic hopeful canoe slalom athlete? Like a, uh, a brief a brief breakdown of how you started canoeing to to pre COVID nineteen uh, you know, Olympic hopeful. Yeah. Um well I my parents were avid canoe trippers. They guided for Black Feather when they were younger and I grew up in, in that um, outdoors canoeing community and then I started at the Ottawa River Runners um, summer camps kayaking I learned to roll my own kayak and I was like this is pretty cool and uh, I don't know I um, had a couple coaches that were like oh you should do slalom and I started doing it like twice a week and then three times a week and then twice a day and <laughs> uh, it kind of snowballed pretty quickly from I guess around 2012 I started uh, the development program at the Ottawa River, River Runners, and then yeah, snowballed, I guess. Yeah. So it's just kind of a natural, a natural progression from like summer camp to slalom camp to slalom racing. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and I think that's like a lot of a lot of people who are slalom racers kind of follow that same stream, right? Yeah, I'd say there's a lot of. Uh, like I guess starting in in wreck boating or just plastic boating kayaking and then you kind of it's it's a bit of a niche sport there's not a lot of places that have slalom gates set up and and that uh the, the infrastructure for slalom and carbon boats uh so it, it's a bit tricky like in terms of you say oh like most people that do slalom uh in Canada that's the case I think we it's you start at a summer camp <laughs> go from there so we haven't really i've actually been taking kind of hiatus on this podcast from talking about COVID 19 because it's a bit depressing yeah but it seems like it's it's especially in your world it's like probably had the biggest impact in like you you had this kind of like uh you know landmarks of like what you were doing throughout the year and what you were working towards what yeah. what are you like how have you readjusted from like whatever you're i guess you were probably on two days before or, uh, and now you're on I guess lockdown at home. Like, what, what does it look like for for people at home? How could you color your color your situation a little bit for people who are like don't really understand what it's like to be a full time slalom canoeist? Yeah, well, uh, I spent two months in Australia this winter. We were doing two or three sessions a day, 
mostly two a day on whitewater and then a gym or a run, something else like that. Uh, and so that went from super high volume. Um, and then we came home in March. And then we were home for three weeks and we were supposed to go to Brazil right after that. Um, so we were in like a very high volume section, I guess, of our training. Uh, and then it was all of a sudden, oh, you're not leaving your house. Uh, so took a, I guess a couple weeks of, of pretty light training. Just, I would go for a run every so often. I don't know. Like I would, I was active, but not riding my bike and stuff, but not in the same way, uh, that I've, I've gotten back into training, uh, for the last, oh, a little while now, quite a, like two months, maybe. I don't know how long this whole thing has been. <laughs> Yeah, the um, time seems to be all the same. Yeah, I've got a good home gym set up now. Uh, collected weights from various friends that live near me uh, at distance, of course, and wiped them down. But I got some good weights, and uh, I have a back shed in the backyard. And um, my brother helped me build a bench pull and a bench press set up. And so I've, I've my strength coach is super great. He adapted uh, to what I have now as a gym. Uh, I adapted my program. So I've got a very good, like, four or five times a week uh, lifting weights, which is nice because that's a very structured situation. And yep. then uh, other than that, I've been using the opportunity to ride my bike, which I haven't been doing the last few summers because don't bring a bike to Europe. And then um, running. And uh, I've been actually paddling my slalom boat uh, alone uh, on water. Um, which has been a, a nice form of therapy. <laughs> and then, yeah, so it's been pretty good. Uh, after the adjustment period, it's been pretty good. Um, getting Do back you think you went through like a, like a morning, like a loss period where you were like had all these like kind of goals laid out and then you like suddenly had them all taken away? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Most definitely. <laughs> uh, it was a, a couple weeks of, of very low motivation uh, not really keen to do anything, not really keen to do anything day after day. And then, I don't know, I guess, I guess I kind of realized how long it was going to be. And then that there was a bit of freedom in, in that realization of just how long it's going to be that it doesn't, it doesn't matter as much. And I kind of, when I took the pressure off myself, uh, in that sense, then I was, I, I got back to enjoying it very quickly, which was good. And I think, a lot of people felt the same way of like, I guess the last two years have been 2020 focused. Um, longer than that, but for me, like very realistically, it was the last two years very um, Olympic driven. And then that, like having, having that, there was a big talk about, oh, Team Canada's not going if they're still going to be Olympics. And then the next day they were like, oh, well, there's actually not going to be an Olympics this year. It's going to be the next year. Uh, and that was a very relieving, uh, um, news release, I guess, the, just having that, um, assurance that we're not, we're not falling behind. We're not, nothing's like everybody else is in the same boat. And then. Yeah. Olympics very, was actually, you know, they were pretty like, they're pretty behind the curve there of saying, yeah, we're shutting it down for this year. Like everyone else was like, absolutely oh, yeah. not. There's no what way. And Olympics was like. No, nah, we're going to hold out, you know, we're going to make a ton of money, like, we're going to hold out, we're going to hold out. Yeah, talk about uh, bad management or something, I don't know. Oh my goodness, yeah. yeah. Um, so are you, are you pretty fired up now that you, like, now that you know Olympics is a year away, you're, like, your timelines, like, add, add one year, are you pretty hyped to just be able to be in better shape, or, like, what's, yeah. your, what's your viewpoint on well, I just got off the phone with my coach, and um, I finished by saying, hey, like, I'm really excited about this. Uh, which I thought was a, a nice, like, I was like, oh, yeah, I actually am really excited about this. This is great. Um, we're going back to basics, as he likes to say. And we're going to spend, because we have about a 15-month block before, realistically, we might have a race. Um, I mean, technically, we still have dates, but I'm very confident that we're not leaving Ottawa or at least Eastern Canada uh, for the next like this summer. So uh, I'm really excited to, to spend the time to work on 
I'm going to write down a list of, well, I've got a list of weaknesses I need to work on. And, and so then I have a whole summer uh, at home at the pump house in Ottawa to work on that. And that's not something I've had for a number of years now because we, we always leave in May, June, and we go to Europe. And then I'm in Europe all summer. And, and, to, we, and to fill people in on that who are not familiar with like the pro slalom world, they, <laughs> like through the, through the summer, there's a bunch of like world championship, world cup races that are like in slalom. That's like what you're working towards as your like yearly targets, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And then, and it's a very Eurocentric sport. So everything's in Europe. Even the little races are in Europe. We have like a, a little race in Europe is 250 people and a little race in Canada is 25 people. So and you know, that's exactly, <laughs> this is like a perfect segue into what I really wanted to talk to you about today, yeah. Lois. I want to talk about like the, the conversation I feel like I'm having the most uh, in the last like five months is like, I'm, I'm trying to save whitewater kayak. I'm trying to figure out what we can all do to work together to stop whitewater kayaking dying out. And yeah. slalom is obviously a big part of that because it, you know, has that Olympic back behind it. Yep. So I want to know like, what's the, what's the slalom scene in Canada uh, and in North America, generally, if you can expand on that, but I, yeah. I know you're going to be more familiar with Canada. Like, what's the scene surrounding slalom? Is it fr like, you know, doing pretty well, thriving? Is it struggling? Um, just give us an outline for people who are not familiar or who just aren't in the, like me, I'm not, I'm not in the slalom scene. I have no idea if there's yeah. a lot of people. Yeah. Um... Is it thriving or is it struggling? That's a hard question. Um, I mean, it doesn't necessarily because, have to be one or the other, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'd say, I would say our, our general direction, like we've got a lot of energy and a lot of organizations that are, are really working towards growing the sport even more. It kind of, I, so I guess I've been aware of things since sort of 2014, 15 was when I started to be aware of like our, our national situation and and since then I've noticed sort of an ebb and flow of participation and then if you look further before that um, like there's a greater ebb and flow of pers participation in it and we used to have we used to be one of the best countries in canoe slalom um, like in the 90s with David Ford he was our he was world champion we had Margaret Langford she was a world cup overall champion I think she was very good anyway we had like some good results and stuff we had more participation at that point and since then I think there's been a general decline I'm not 100% sure I, would, I wouldn't quote myself on that but um I think right now I would say we're struggling um we need we need more bums and boats uh but I don't know I don't know generally speaking um like I can't speak to the participation of of like the development programs in Alberta and BC and stuff, but I do know that uh, like you go to nationals and it's not it's not a huge event that's for sure. <laughs> so and is there like a a lot of races for like younger kids or that have like younger kids categories? Uh, is there a lot of pro like you said you started in like a summer camp wait and then moved on to some racing. Yeah. Um, is there a lot of programs that kind of feed um, that like base, like the base of the pyramid, if you like? Well, our, yeah, not, we've got some good programs, but we've lost, we had the Ontario summer series. And I think I, I think in 2013, when I raced that, it was the last series, last year, we really had it. We went to MKC, we went to Minden, we had one in Ottawa uh, and they were properly competitive at the like young girls young boys there was like quite a few boats um and then we lost that we didn't have a, a full-time coach for a while in ottawa uh and then in 2016 uh, 17 maybe uh anthony collin came from france and uh he got hired by whitewater ontario uh as a coach and he started redeveloping the program, basically, uh, that had had a lull in an organization for a while. And so since then, we've had more kids coming through uh, and more races in the summers. Um, but then he also is working with the national team. He's working for Canoe Kayak Canada now. So he's out of there. And then it's this, it's this perpetual cycle of, oh, we have races this year. Oh, no, we don't really have races this year. 
so there's no there's no great foundation in my opinion um of races that are sustainable that kind of each venue organizes themselves uh we don't have that like we don't have and song kind of needs those those like local races right like that kind of that's how the whole the whole cycle perpetuates it it needs those lower level races to encourage kids excited to go and you need like older athletes there to make the kids excited to go because I know that when when I was 13 or 14 and I got to go race and Michael Taylor was going to be there and he went to the Olympics so that's pretty cool you know it's that it's that I would like I was that kid I was super excited right like you're like yeah and then now now I guess I'm I'm not like anybody's hero but I I definitely like I like to go and I encourage kids and you see people and they're like, they smile and they, they, you see the excitement and that's, um, but we don't have the races to go to, to have that excitement. So I think that's, that's our biggest problem right now. And I, I get what you're saying. Like back, back in the day, like more than yeah. 10 years ago now, I used to race slalom when I lived, when I was in England, cause there was yeah. like a, a good spot near where I lived and I would go to like, uh, there's like four divisions of like slalom races in England. Yeah. So there's like a, a like really low like entry level, and then there's like some mid levels, and there's like a one top division called prem- Premier Division, which is like all the people who are like in the in in pretty competitive for yeah. like and who's going to get the, in goal, that, like, right? top, the top spot. It, yeah, and yeah. and you can work up. Through, and I was like, I was in Division One, I, I think. No, I, I was in Division One for sure. And, but it was fun and but there was like a lot of people like you could like some of the bigger races had like 100 races you know like yeah. it was difficult to get a spot sometimes yeah. for you know an amateur level competition with no prize money and it's, in, it's always interesting to me to come from that to here where it's like there's not really that kind of like bustling scene of a lot of people really hyped on it mm-hmm. and I so what I'm trying to figure out is what we can do to help improve our scene to have a lot of people hyped on it yeah it's difficult to like obviously in england it's like very regulated and there's a lot of people who volunteer their time um, or parts of their time to to make that happen and it's it's not you know two or three people doing a bunch of things it's like 20 people doing uh, like really small jobs you know as part of the system but I don't know what we can do here. I don't know what your thoughts are on this of, of how we can get more, uh, maybe it's more races or more camps or what do you think would be the best use of resources to get more bums in boats, as you said? That's, that's the uh, million dollar question. It's, it's something that I've, I've thought about and uh, I've, I've worked at, um, like gone to meetings that are, at the Ottawa river runners and we've brainstormed and come up with ideas and then sort of there's not, I think, I think our biggest problem is we need a huge amount of motivation for like five years or something to grow the base because at at this point it's so few volunteers and they're spending so much time helping us and I'm super grateful for them, but I also understand that, that that's not sustainable, right? Like you have, one dad and he's like well I'm I'm done now after 15 years of spending every minute that I had like I want a life of my own and then you have to find another mom or dad to do that and And see I think this might be part of our problem not just for slalom but for like white water as a whole is that there's it's so it's it's there's not enough people there's not enough people who are like looking at it um from the community point of like I I really enjoy this sport what can I do to help it grow and yeah. everyone's set, like out having a great time, which is fine. Like, but at some point, that's like a, a cycle that's going to push us into not having enough resources to, to keep it going anymore. For sure, uh, yeah. And I'm pretty, I'm, I'm quite worried about it. And I think we, we kind of need to get a bit of an attitude shift from as many people as we can in our community. And this is probably the same in Slalom, where instead of having one dad or one mom who's like volunteers tons and tons of their time if we could split that work between 20 mums and dads, you know? Exactly. Yeah. And it's, it's that it's, but it's finding the sort of the momentum in volunteering. Like when one person starts to do it and then somebody else helps them, that's how it, how it grows. Right. Instead of 
one person doing it and people kind of looking at it and saying, oh, well, that's done. Somebody's taking care of that and changing the mentality into, oh, like, what can I do as well? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's exactly like that. That exactly how you just said it. Like, what can I do as well? And yeah. I, I don't know how we can get more people into that. What what can I do as well? Mindset to help out. Can you think of anything specifically for slalom that would get more I guess not more races happening this year, but like more more opportunities for races to happen. Like how how does one go about getting a race from from nuts to nails? Well, I think actually this year might be a very good opportunity for that. Um, the trick is it's it's ever changing, so it's hard to say. But this opportunity where everybody is grounded at home um, with less options of other things to do we are an outdoor sport we are like you could you could run an entire race and not go near two meters of like next to somebody um if you wanted to like you could totally I don't think you could organize a race right now but I think it's very reasonable to think that in three months that you could organize a race and I think so I think that maybe if everybody's home sort of growing that this year could be a a starting block for that um but all right so uh, let's thought let's thought experiment that out a little bit then let's say someone's listening to this maybe not in a slalom place like ottawa city where there's like already a slalom course established but let's say someone has access to a local waterway it doesn't have to be crazy white water like you know class one class two like i remember doing like races on almost flat water yeah. like with you, tiny bits you of totally current. can run flat water races what, 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 do you, what do you have to do start to finish like, you know you live near a piece of water which you have the owner's permission to access. What else do you need? Well, do you know how to kayak? Okay, that's step two. Step two is <laughs> uh, learning to roll, um, which is actually, you know, it's a technique-based thing. You Once you learn it, you're good. To be, to be yeah. honest, like, when I used to race slalom, there was a lot of kids who couldn't roll. Yeah, that's true. Like, tons of them. Yeah. Like, if I for the... It's... The, the younger division, the lower division race, that was like <laughs> half the field, couldn't roll. Yeah, Still out there yeah. having a good time. So yeah. what else do you need to organize a race? You've got some people who want to race. You've got a place to race. What else some, do you need? Some uh, one-inch PVC pipes and uh, some spray paint and okay. some wire. Okay. And uh, two very coordinated people and one person with a good throwing arm. And you've got to... You gotta set gates up, and that's a that is a barrier um, because a lot of uh, time goes into setting up a gate. Uh, even if you're very efficient, it, it's a it's a task. It takes time um, because you need to get a wire across the river, and then you need to put a, a gate on it, which is two pipes and a cross piece. And you know, it's, I guess it's just like it's one of those things <laughs> that just eats your day. Um, but once that's done, then they're set up. Uh, and r- roughly how many gates do you need to make a race? Uh, well, you could have, if you had 10 gates, you could have a, a fun kids race, but up to 22 or 24 would be okay. like, like two hundred, two to 400 meters is ideal. So you've got, water. so let's say you've got two to 400 meters of like flat water or easy, easy white water. Yeah. You've got some people who are coordinated and willing to spend a day getting some wire across the river and hanging up to 20 gates yeah you've got some people who want to race yeah what else do you need, you need um, someone someone to set up a course yeah somebody needs to set the course uh you don't even need bibs you don't even need you need two stopwatches and uh i guess you some gate judges would be good um, what and what's the role so, of a gate judge for people who don't know yeah so in slalom you go you start at the top of the course and you go down between gates uh like a downhill ski race um except for those gates set up in eddies uh it's the counter currents of the of the river and so that's the upstream gate and so there's six to eight of those in a race and then there's um like 18 ish downstream gates and uh so you need so those are so there's green gates which are the downstream gates and there's red gates which are the upstream gates but you don't even need that. You could just you could just explain to people. Honestly, if if you've got twenty people racing, you just tell people this is an upstream gate. <laughs> if if you wanted to do it that way, um, or you can paint them, spray paint them. Uh, 
and then a gate judge is uh, a volunteer that stands on the course, on the side of the course, and watches to see if people go through the gate or touch the gate or don't go through the gate. And so if you touch the gate, you get two seconds added to your time. And if you miss the gate, you get 50 seconds added to your time, your final time. Uh, and for that matter, you don't even need to have separate people doing that. You can finish a race and walk up on the side of the bank and you can judge the next person, right? Like you, you could, you can, like grassroots, there's, there's options to have like a very... Yeah, you can, you can really recruit those athletes into doing a lot of work for you to make that race run. Like if everyone wants exactly. the race to happen... You yeah. can make it happen. Do yeah. you need anything else? You probably need some kind of insurance, I guess. But if you're probably, with yeah, your national <laughs> governing body, you might be able to get away with that. Or yeah. there might be a workaround. Uh, is there anything else that you need to get a race started? Uh, motivation. <laughs> motivation. Yeah, you need a couple, a few people who are organized. Like, what do you think that's going to take? Like, four people, five people? If you, yeah, if you have four people, you could, you could run a race. And yeah. you could, but I've just push out those tasks as we've just described and maybe you have yeah. someone who's overall responsible for the timekeeping maybe yeah. you have um i don't know what else do you, is there anything else you can think of that you need because um, i, I want to make it easy. i want to make it easy for people who are listening right now who are like yeah i don't know what i can do you could run a slalom race right you can do it in whatever kayaks you have you can yeah. you can get some pipes you can get some cable you can get some friends you can get, yeah. you know, get, get your cables over your section, set up your course, have all the well, athletes there on a certain time. And to me, that's like one of the great things. Sorry to interrupt. One of the great things about slalom is you can turn um, 200 meters of flat water into a fun afternoon uh, that normally you would be like, what am I going to do on this for two hours? Well, you can paddle slalom on it for two hours, right? Um, you don't need, like, you don't need to go run a river necessarily I'm obviously it's more fun to have white water and to do that but if you don't have like to, in terms of just like short amount of time for high reward it's a really it's a great way to get in a boat you know into a and, I mean and I think for a lot of people too uh, especially uh people who are really respectful of social distancing who aren't doing shuttles of people exactly if running a river like because you can't shuttle because there's no one who lives in your house to go with you yeah. Um, you know, setting up a 200 meter slalom course on some flat water is a great way to still go kayaking and yeah. kind of keep that social distancing protocol in place. Um, and, you know, people can just rewind back here and they've got like a guide basically of how to run a race in their local area. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think, I think that, yeah, time at home and it could be a good opportunity for more people to. You know, you got your old dancer in your your parents' garage. Go, go get it. It's a great boat. <laughs> you yeah. Know, it's, boat. Yeah. Get up. Yeah, you can get after it, right? You can get after it in anything. It doesn't really matter. Yeah. Like you know, getting getting around those, getting around the poles, getting to the end. It's fun. You're out there with other people. You're having fun. Like you hit gates. You don't hit gates. Whatever. It doesn't Who matter. Who cares? That much, really. <laughs> yeah. Um. But the more. I think we agree that the the more um, participation there is, the more interest in participation there is, equals like more participation um, in the end. Like maybe not doesn't immediately open up opportunities to participate, but like if there's more people in an area who are hyped about something, it will spread to other people who will want to get hyped about it. Yeah, and uh, sort of on that point is that I. I find that there's a bit of, uh, I guess, a sense of elitism in the kayaking community in general, slalom and recreational and whatever you want to call yourself. In Canada, we are very like, well, I'm a, I'm a whitewater kayaker. I'm pretty cool. Um, and like, I don't, th I think that's a, a it's not toxic. Well, maybe it's toxic, but it's not, it's not a productive attitude. I think like kind of letting that go and just say like, hey, like, you might not be a whitewater kayaker, but this is what I'm going to go do. And if you swim, it's fine. I'm not going to save you because social distancing, but you can swim to shore and you can swim with your boat. And, like, we don't have to, just because we're whitewater kayakers doesn't mean we can't invite people who aren't whitewater kayakers to go spend time outside together uh, on flat water. It's, um, I just did this podcast, like, a few weeks ago. Like, whenever, uh, whenever this comes out, it will have been the one before this one with Anna Levesque, who um, used to do Girls at Play. Now she has another um, kayak school thing. 
Uh, yeah. But she was saying, like, Kermit was talking about the same topic of, like, how to increase participation. And she was saying we need to do a better job of kind of meeting people where they're at. Um, yeah. Which is kind of exactly how you just described, um, you know, getting people in slow on there. Like, we, we've got to do a better job of saying, like, you know, like, if you're interested in this, I can help you. I can help you get into it. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Like, and as, as and much as we can mean that. I'm necessarily going to bring my friend who doesn't know how to kayak on a class four river with me, but that doesn't mean that I'm not going to go run the Ottawa river when they're ready to run the Ottawa river. Uh, even though it's not like the hardest white water I could be paddling, you know, like yeah. it's that kind of thing is the, my attitude towards it. And I, I, I get, a, I get sad when I hear people are, are very like, Oh, well, like, I'm not going to do that. It's too easy or whatever. With my yeah friends. it's <laughs> never yeah it's never you can always make it harder like there's yeah. no anyone it like whenever you meet people who are like well it's kind of too easy for me it's like well you can make it harder for yourself like, it <laughs> yeah yeah like, and it, I think you, you control the difficulty level sometimes yeah and slalom is a cool opportunity for that too especially like we have the pump house it's what I don't know class two not even maybe class one and a half two and uh well I guess it's two and don't really know um it's moving it's two yeah <laughs> It's got rocks. Uh, got rocks too. Got eddies. Yeah. Dude. And um, like our whole national team, not our whole national team, but like the majority of our national t- team trains there every day. Like it's, and we can go out and we can paddle with people who are learning to kayak at the same time on the same piece of water and both have enjoyment out of that same thing. And I think slalom is a very cool thing for that in terms of like the global enjoyment of kayaking in Canada. Uh, if we can expand a bit of slalom participation, uh, that's, it's, it's basic whitewater technique and, and that's applicable to going to run rivers and building your base and your comfort in, in whitewater. Um, so I think that, like, yeah, it's exactly, it's all part of that bigger umbrella, right? Like it's, yeah. it's just another facet, another feather in the cap of whitewater kayaking. And I don't, I don't really care how many people we have to get into it, but we need to get more people into it if we're going to all stay in it, I think yeah yeah and and you don't doesn't just because you do slalom doesn't mean you can only do slalom or you have to be on the national team or you have to like want to go to the olympics either right there's there is a like if you look at so many sports there's like beer league hockey like why don't we have a beer league slalom i'm not saying drinking on the river but like drink after like go go like go have a wednesday night race and then go for beers and then and never even think about the olympics and like, why don't we have that that attitude towards it? And that's that's another question I have in terms of like growing the participation in Canada. It's not just kids; it's, it's people in their twenties and their thirties and their fifties and their sixties. And that could be a great idea. Like, you know, you, you just kind of hash it yourself there. Beer league slalom. Like, every, like people can just rewind this podcast back like six minutes or whatever. You've you've got like a you, you, it's an outline of how to run a slalom race. It could be just for adults. You might maybe have to drink a beer before you participate or afterwards or whatever. Um, you know, beer league slalom could be a thing. Yeah. For and, everyone. And also, then you've got your people who are a bit older, who have the time maybe to help run races for kids. And then you can build a pyramid from from the bottom and have that so you can go with your kids and you can go to your beer league and it can be the same event and you know you got so many different things yeah, you have wednesday night beer league saturday morning kids league exactly ready. i yeah. love it i love it <laughs> lois i think this has been really useful for people um who don't know about slalom and who are thinking about it or maybe they are interested but don't have opportunities in their area and they don't know where to start like this is a good starting point i think um so really thanks a lot for taking the time to to chat with us where can people follow you uh, on the the socials? Um, my Instagram is Lois Betteridge, and uh, I, I I have a Facebook page too, but it's none of it's too exciting. <laughs> Saw something on there about eggs when I was uh, uh, trying to find. You for, uh, yeah, that's my I, my greatest sponsor is the Egg Farmers of Ontario. So get cracking. Get cracking. <laughs> See what I did there. Well. Uh, Lois, thanks for taking the time. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, and I thanks will for the call. See you in a future episode of this podcast. Peace.